Hey, surprise. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Buenas noches. Um, typically, I do not go live on Monday nights, but this month is a little special and a little crazy. Um, I just got back from a sewing retreat last night, and I have a flight in about 10 hours to head to another retreat, my retreat in El Salvador. But um, an opportunity presented itself for us to have a chat with uh, a Black woman who lives here in Mexico City and share all about uh, her experience here and the restaurant she has opened. So she will be joining us in a matter of moments. Um, so yeah, so that's why you're seeing me on a Monday night when I don't typically go live, but for the rest of this month, like the, cause it's my birthday month, the rules, there are no rules. Who knows when I could be going live. So how are you doing? If you're here, uh, joining me live, let me know in the chat. If you are watching from the future, hello. I hope things are great in the future. Um, thank you for tuning in. My name is Adelia Borshade. Um, though most people on the internet know me as Picky Girl Travels the World. Um, uh, I have been calling Mexico City home since about 2017. On this channel, I talk about my life here, my experiences here, as well as, uh, what I do, I guess you could say professionally, which is to help Black women master their money so that they can make financially confident decisions so that they can live life on their terms. So on this channel, we talk about living abroad. We talk about travel. We talk about money. If those things are of interest to you, you are in the right place. Uh, you should totally subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications. So when I go live surprise like this, you'll get a notification. Um, so, hey, y'all. And welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Okay, so uh, <laughs> we are just getting started. Uh, don't typically go live on Mondays and didn't tell anybody. So everybody's trickling in right now. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Because I did not introduce you. No, that's fine. This is, we just rolling with it tonight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Tiara Darnell. I am the owner of Black Sea Cocina, Mexico City's first soul food restaurant. And I have been in Mexico City for, it'll be two years next week, actually. Two years next week. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, let's jump in and like, let's kind of start, I guess, what would be the beginning in how you ended up here in Mexico City. So I had been to probably 30 some other countries and never to Mexico. I think I was one of those people who kind of had the attitude of like, oh, it's right there. Like I'll get there someday, but I would rather go to like Thailand or Morocco or wherever um, because they're further away. And during the pandemic, um, I'm originally from PG County, Maryland, but I have lived in, in Morocco for two years, Buffalo, um, I'm sorry, in Morocco for two years. Portland, Oregon for eight years, and then Buffalo, New York um, for like the first year of the pandemic. And um, towards the end of the first year of the pandemic, my friend had been living in Merida and I saw him in Portland when I went back to visit. And he was just like, why are you here? You should be living in Mexico. It's amazing. Like you're already working remotely. There's no reason that like you have to be here. And I was like, you know what? You're right. Like I could pretty much be doing the same thing, social distancing, chilling at home and doing it in another country. And so for me, the proximity of Mexico during the pandemic was actually a bonus because it's so close to home. So if anything happened to me or to my family, I could get back very quickly. And I already spoke some Spanish. So it just kind of made sense. Like, all right, I took a detour from learning Spanish because of all of these life things. And now I have the opportunity to to go to Mexico and and to, you know, live abroad. Why not? And so... I came to Mexico City because I knew one person here 
Um, shout out to DJ Black Daria, Janae, <laughs> who's a DJ um, in Portland, but now here she lives in Mexico City too. And she was the one person I knew here and from knowing her and then just being social during my first, I feel like I was more social probably like the first six months that I was here. Then I found my crew and then I kind of like stopped going out. But <laughs> I found my friends and found my community. And um, and since then, yeah, I've just been here and now I have a restaurant, so I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. Okay, so, okay. But still, there's a big jump there. Like, oh, I'll go kick it in Mexico during the pandemic <laughs> to I'm going to put down roots. I'm going to open a, a, a restaurant. Like that's that's a big jump. Yeah, yeah, no, it definitely is. Um, when I first got here, I was working for Spotify. So my day job is as a podcast producer and editor. So that is a job, especially as people are like looking for options for remote jobs, like podcast production is a really big one. It's really easy um, to do from anywhere um, for most shows. And so I was working for Spotify. They, you would think as a global streaming, music streaming company, audio streaming company, that they would be comfortable with like their employees working at least from wherever they have an office. And now they do have a policy that's like that, but it just depends on if you get approval to go. I did not get approval to go and I just went anyway. So I was down here for about nine months clandestinely um, before they laid off my whole team. So it was kind of a blessing in disguise because I, I came here, I had nine months of being able to save. And when I got laid off, which wasn't, it was like a shock, but it wasn't a surprise. I feel like the writing was kind of on the wall. But when it happened, the savings that I was able to accumulate over those nine months gave me the opportunity to just like take a minute to breathe and figure out what I wanted to do before having to rush off to get a job just to like keep a paycheck coming in. So I had about like six months of savings um, stashed away. And one of the first things I did was I signed up for um, Spanish classes at the National University, um, Mexico, UNAM. UNAM. Um, I signed up there and I did the CEPE program, which is like their um, center for, you know, extranjeros that want to learn um, Spanish as a second language. So I went there. They have seven levels and I placed I into say, level that's five. A full that's a full time job. There's I different ways class. to do it. But yeah, yeah. I took class there when I first moved here and that was like all I had time to do. Yeah, it was really intense. Um, I was still freelancing and I felt like the Spanish classes were my full time job because I was going in person five days a week and it was like, you know, a 45 minute commute each way. So that pretty much took up most of my time. But I still worked freelance um, <laughs> in the evenings and then like woke up and scribbled my homework down in the mornings and then went to class and, you know, like did it that way for that first term. And in between doing that, I had, I think for that first year that I had been, almost first year that I had been in Mexico, I had already been entertaining and having people at my house and I would always cook for people and they would come over and chill. And it was just like, you know, a, a, a come through. And I realized that it was time to stop feeding the community for free all the time. <laughs> and so in addition to doing the Spanish classes, doing pop-ups and not just sharing that food with folks from the black community here who miss that little taste of home, but also introducing Mexicans to soul food and like the differences between black people from the US, African Americans versus Africans versus people who are from the Caribbean. Like, yes, we're all black, the diaspora is wide, but we're not all the same. We don't all have the same culture. We don't all eat the same food. We don't all have the same slang. Like there's just a lot of variation and, you know, beauty in the blackness. So, so that was kind of like the idea that had been kicking around. And I started out doing a small business accelerator program here, um, mostly for, it was open to all women, but I would say most of the people in the cohort were foreigners. Um, and it was hosted by Three Day Startup. They have a program they're doing right now too. But I just, it gave me an opportunity to get my business plan written down and to sort of like figure out the steps I needed to take in order to get the pop-ups from just pop-ups to a brick and mortar space. And so I started out 
doing that program. I did my first event. 70 people came to Soul Food Sunday, the very first one in April of last year. It was at my house, uh, my apartment. My apartment cannot even fit half of that many people in it. Even with the room, like, no. I was about to say. It was crazy. How on earth did y'all fit all those people in there? And my kitchen is about as big as this little square that I'm talking to you in right now. So it was, it it worked out that I hadn't figured out how to not overbuy for my events because I had all this food. All these people came through. Everyone was fed. Everyone enjoyed themselves. Like the music and the community, like everything. It was really, really beautiful. Um, Even from what I could see being like separate from everybody. Everybody was up on the roof. I was down, you know, in the kitchen in my apartment. But it was just really amazing. And so that kind of gave me the confidence to know that, okay, there's something here. Just keep going with the pop-ups and like learning and figuring out your recipes and, and, you know, just talking to people and spreading the word about what you're doing. And I did that. And then in November of this year, I got some more sad freelancer news that one of like my main paychecks was going to be drying up. Um, I was doing, um, working on Roy Wood Jr.'s podcast, the comedian from The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. And so Trevor Noah left The Daily Show and then the trickle down effect was that Roy's podcast got put on hold indefinitely. And so I just kind of had this realization between the Spotify thing earlier last year and then this thing, I just got, I don't want to be somebody's collateral damage anymore. I want to be able to control my own fortune and destiny to the extent that I can. And so that just kind of gave me the push to say, all right, I'm going to find a physical space and I'm just going to take the plunge and do it. And again, same thing, the money that I had saved up from some freelance work that I had, that's what I used to put a deposit on the space that I found um, three minutes walking from where I live now in Narvarte. Um, and the space is, it, it was a, it was a big jump, you know, big risk, uh, but it's a space that can hold about 60 people between the outside patio and the inside um, dining area. And it's a space that is still in progress, even though we are open for service, but it is something that feels like home and a place that people can come to. And like I said, for the black community from the US, get a taste of of home and, and be in community and, you know, just enjoy one another. Now, were you somebody, you know that I am an introvert and you also know like I don't cook. So I'm I'm trying to wrap my head around like you were just like, hey, strangers, come to my house. I'll feed you. Like, were you always somebody who who love to cook or, you know, like have people over? Yeah. My mom uh and my dad were like that growing up. I grew up in PG County, like I said, PG County, Maryland. And I remember like my childhood home. We had a huge backyard and a nice deck. And I just have so many memories of like family and friends and the neighbors coming over and, you know, us grilling and cooking out. And there was definitely like spades and big whisk being played and gin and juice being drank. And like, it was always just like, you know, a a community space is what our house felt like, even though it was our home. And so I do think that um, that's something that has always just felt important to me is to like have an open house and cultivate that space. And I think also just from being someone who enjoys traveling, like I like talking to people, like I'm not going to tell you that I'm like a super extrovert. I think I'm a introverted extrovert. Like I need my alone time and like, you know, peace and quiet to be able to be on for other people. But I do enjoy people genuinely and I do enjoy cooking and food is just such an easy way to bring people together and everybody's really happy and and this is this is the first physical space that I've had, but I worked in the Oregon wine industry when I lived in Oregon um, for a year. That was a it was a good experience. The takeaway was that I would rather drink the wine than make it. That was the hardest work that I have ever done in my life. But it was a good experience, and it helped me learn what I didn't want to do, which was like to actually work in the wine industry. Um, and then from there, I also. I was like working as a bud tender because this was like the beginning of when cannabis became legal there. And I met some people who were chefs and doing like infused dinners and things like that. So I would help them out. So I feel like I've always dabbled with food, but you know, when you have something that you enjoy doing 
and then you monetize it, sometimes it's not as fun anymore. And so I think I kind of stayed away from doing like really like, I don't know, like really intense food experiences or like making, you know, um, a job out of those because I just didn't want this thing that I love that speaks to me and like my experience growing up and like my family's way of inviting people. I didn't want that to, I didn't want to lose that part of it. Um, and so I just kind of danced around it. Um, and I did, you know, I had an ice cream business when I was in Buffalo, New York, very for a little bit too. So that's another thing. Like ice cream just inherently makes people happy. When you tell them you make ice cream, people usually smile. So, I mean, I'm trying to bring in like all of these different food experiences that I've had and incorporate it into the space that I have now. And I'm happy to say that so far, even though it has been, there's been days where I've cried. There's been days where I've woken up at three o'clock in the morning because my mind is like on the restaurant, even though I'm trying to sleep. You know, there's been days where a vendor who was supposed to do something for me didn't do it on time or I was afraid he was going to run away with my money. Like all of the ups and downs of being a startup and doing something as a solo entrepreneur on top of then doing it in a foreign country, on top of doing it in a language that is not your first language. Like it is very stressful. It's very intense, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the the story you've recounted to us, I think one of the important pieces is the pivots that you made. Mm -hmm. um, on this channel, I talked to a lot of women who have moved abroad or who want to move abroad through the work that I do as well. And um, my message last week was about it's okay if you don't have it all mapped out, you don't have everything figured out. And that when things, you know, don't turn out the way you want, it's okay to pivot and try something else. Like things not working out is not like the end of your story. And so no. I, I really like that you shared that because again, that just underscores that. And sometimes things not working out is just like, the push that you need to do the thing that you already wanted to do anyway, but you were just kind of like him and hawing about whether or not you should actually, you know, do it. So I don't know. I think that every time I've had something that didn't work out or, um, you know, maybe something that I guess you would consider a failure, there's always been something else that's come out of it that I couldn't have gotten to if these other things hadn't happened in order to put me in that place and put this other thing in my path. So I think that a lot of times it's the fear of the unknown and the fear of failure that keep people from doing things. And I was just back home in DC recently and I was talking to my dad and he just had his, it's like his great aunt-in-law. She's like 94 and she just moved into the house so they could care for her, you know, in these um, most wise years of her life. And I told him, I was like, you know, one of the things that that made me okay with taking this jump into entrepreneurship was that I knew that if all else failed, I will come here and I will take care of great auntie and I'll just live at home and I'll be the in-home caregiver that you can't find, you know? So like worst case scenario, there is a safety net. It might not be exactly what I want, but nobody's about to have me out here destitute on the street in Mexico because I took, you know, a big leap into entrepreneurship. And if it didn't work out, um, you know, I, I would be okay. So I think with that freedom in mind and like knowing that I have the support of my family and my community and friends, it just makes it a lot easier to take that plunge. And, and so, like I said, it's been scary, but like I said, there's no, no other way I'd have it. Well, several of the ladies are looking forward uh, to trying the restaurant. Dee is moving here very shortly uh, and excited about it. Um, Natasha mentioned that the shrimp chilaquiles were fire. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And yes. Uh, Abba saw you at the market buying organic greens. And yes. I, think, I believe she's planning to be there Saturday. Now, my question is, why soul food? Like, 
I don't know. Why soul food? Well, firstly, there, as far as I know, and if anybody else knows contrary, like, let me know. But I don't believe there's any physical, like, food representation of African-American culture in Mexico, even though there's a history of African-Americans escaping to Mexico for their freedom from the South. And there are slaves who came from West Africa here through the Port of Veracruz who helped build Zocalo. There's a lot of Black history in Mexico that seems to have been erased, forgotten, or ignored for whatever reason. And so for me, I felt like this was an opportunity not only to cook what I know, um, but also to do something that would honor the heritage that I'm learning about and what I already know. And also to just, again, have a platform to be able to teach Mexicans who may not know, again, the differences between Black people from the U.S. and other areas of the diaspora and also maybe even their own the roots of like Black history here in Mexico. So most of the, what I'm doing is like classic soul food. But for example, like the shrimp and shrimp and chip chile chilaquiles that came because there's no there's no grits here there's no grits and the reason that there's no grits here is because there's no cultural context for them every corn product that you have here in mexico goes under the process of nixtamalization where they're wetting the corn and they're milling it into the masa that they use to make tortillas grits come before that you don't wet the corn you grind it as it's dry and that's how you get the grits so this is something that's new to the culture here. I'm about to start grinding my own grits just so we can have them here. Just like I'm going to be actually this week um, working with a farmer to grow several different varieties of collard greens here. So that way there's going to be more collard greens at the market. And Abba, who saw me buying it, I feel like I remember that day it was her and one other person. I thought I was about to get jumped for these collard greens. <laughs> they were like, where did you get them? So I was like, I can't tell you. Um, I have the monopoly on collard greens right now. But I brought some seeds back from a collective um, in Virginia, the Heirloom Collard Project. It's my dog. And, um, and so I'm going to be growing like six different varieties of collard greens, um, working with a local farmer here. And then, you know, we'll bring them to market and there will be collard greens for everybody and not just the ones that we're used to seeing in the store, you know, on our shelves in the U.S. I can't, I've been, I was there when you kind of, I wouldn't even call it a soft opening. I came yeah. for uh, the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. but y'all know I don't eat greens, so I yes. can't speak to that. However, I can tell you that everybody in the restaurant was quite enthusiastic about the greens. Yes. So. Yes. Um, I'll take that to mean that they were tasty, but y'all know that fire, that me. fire, except for the one person from North Carolina who said I should put more vinegar. I was like, okay, North Carolina, thank you. I'll put vinegar on the table for you. <laughs> We've got a few, uh, kind of questions, requests, uh, global granny was wanting to know if it's vegetarian friendly. Yes. Um, I've heard on more than one occasion that a lot of people are really surprised to hear that the collard greens are vegan. They are so good. Um, I do have right now on the menu this um, oyster mushroom etouffee. Um, so that's vegan, vegetarian. It's really delicious as well. And I'm working on a recipe for stuffed collard greens is going to be um, vegan as well. So there's a lot of options for people. I'm trying to, I know like historically, it doesn't always feel like soul food has been uh, a genre of food that is like, you know, inviting to people who don't eat meat or like heavy, heavy, you know, dairy products, like whatever it is like that. But I am trying to be as inclusive as possible so that everybody can have like something when they come. I think the main thing is that I've been emphasizing to people that the menu is not fixed to what I have right now. We're adding new things as we figure out how to source ingredients. And that's kind of been like the main challenge is one, you know, the sourcing the ingredients to be able to do things and do things, especially for me, as I'm not a vegan or vegetarian, I want to make sure the food is good and doesn't feel like an afterthought. Like I want people to know that I really like cared about their experience, like what they're eating. So finding the right ingredients and then also 
I have started this up with no investors. Like this has been purely me and I'm like about $40,000 in right now and I'm at my my end, <laughs> you know? So I, when it comes to, again, like the ingredients and everything, it's a process, it takes time. I'm building on it and there's gonna be more to come. But right now there is something for everybody. Okay, and there was a request for peach cobbler and pineapple <laughs> upside down cake would be great, just FYI. All right, peach cobbler might be seasonal and pineapple upside down cake, we'll, I will work on that, yeah. Okay, okay, all right. Um, glass half full is like, okay, so a visit to CDMX, definitely moving up, up <laughs> upper list. Um, You mentioned about like sharing our culture with uh, locals, with Mexicans, who I often find don't really realize how much Black history exists in their own country. Yeah. And um, and you're right. I don't know that they get. I don't know, because I don't know if this happens to you, but when people ask me where I'm from and I stay the U.S., often there's a surprise there. Because, of course, mm -hmm. they were pegging me for some other place. Um, yeah. What has the reception been like from your Mexican clientele? Um, well, first, I will say I have had that experience less so here. Um, I mean, it's happened, but I was already prepared for that because the same exact thing happened in Morocco when I was living there. But the conversation would be like, all right, but where are your parents from? where are their parents from? And it's just like, okay, you have no concept of like the transatlantic slave trade. So yeah, I wasn't trying to do that education um, on a regular basis like Morocco, but here it's happened a little bit less so I can have that conversation and not feel drained by it. But in terms of the food, people have been very receptive to it. I think Mexicans in general, like they love, they love flavor. That's part of the reason why it's been so hard for me to travel in other places of Latin America because you get so spoiled by the food here. Like if it doesn't have Chile, I'm like, this is bland. Like, I don't know what's happening right now, but like y'all need to put some, 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 something on here, some tilted peen, some Serrano, I don't know, something. But um, most people have been super open. Um, I have on the back of the menu, like a short explanation of like soul food, which, you know, that's really hard to like keep it um, to a minimum, but just like the roots of it and where it came from and how it's not all necessarily from the southern part of the U.S. I mean, we don't have time to go into the great migration and all that kind of stuff, but enough to say that there's Black people all over the country and that we have found a way to take what we've learned from generations of, of family members moving and going and making it our own wherever we are in the U.S. So for me, um, I think a good way to introduce people to the food is also to kind of meet them where they are. So like, for example, the the shrimp and chip chilaquiles, like they know what chilaquiles are. It's weird that there's shrimp on it. But when I explain it to you that like, hey, there's this dish that is really popular that is would normally have grits, but because I can't get grits, I'm gonna replace the corn grits with the corn tortillas. And now we have something that's very familiar to you, but that's also familiar to me and it's delicious. And we can have this conversation about the similarities in our culture when it comes to corn and the importance of corn, but just the different ways that we process it and how it ends up on our plate. Okay. All right. Um, Glass Half Full wants to know if people want to make donations, how would they do that? Yes. Um, I'm going to be starting a GoFundMe. I wish I had it up right now, but um, you can reach out to me directly um, on the Black Sea Cocina Instagram page. There's also um, a Facebook page, which I will say, be patient with it. It's new. I've had the Instagram for much longer, but I'm going to be adding some stuff to the Facebook page as well. But any of those ways you can reach out to me and uh, we can definitely... Um, accept donations and I and greatly appreciate it because like I said there's a lot of stuff that still needs to happen in order to get the place um fully realized um in terms of the vision that I have for it and it's definitely going to be a community effort okay so if you are watching this in the future 
I would imagine that you can find information and details about the GoFundMe on the Black to Cocina Instagram page and that the link for that is in the description of this video and it's also at the bottom of the screen right now. Um, we had another question which I hadn't even considered, and I wonder if you had. Uh, once you're established, are you looking to branch out and have multiple locations in Mexico City or other parts of Mexico? Mm. I mean, yes, the ambitious part of me is like, yes, absolutely. Um, but I also believe in getting the foundation right before trying to do something more. Um, I am typically kind of an impatient person, but with this, I recognize that like I need to be patient. I need to have time to build my my team and find the right people and, um, you know, just get established and really like get a good foothold here where I am. But yeah, that would be fantastic um, to have multiple locations. It would be great to have multiple different concepts and maybe not the exact same thing in other places. Um, but I also want to be a resource for other people who want to open up their own businesses. So I can't do it all. I don't necessarily want to do it all. Like I I would like to, I feel like I've been living in semi-retirement here. And now I just went and got myself <laughs> like the biggest baby ever to take care of. So I would like to be able to, I've been keeping notes and keeping track of things just so I can share with other people like, okay, this is what my experience was. Here are the questions that I didn't ask because either I didn't know or I didn't think to ask, or here are the ways that something was said to me, which might be a little bit misleading if you don't know about X, Y, and Z. So there's stuff like that. Um, you know, I have a really great, just a super dear friend and partner. Um, uh, actually, not. I mean, he's not a business partner, but he's a partner in crime. I would say for helping me get my my RFC, which is like the tax ID number that I need, getting my business incorporated. He's uh, the person who is like, I don't care what time of the night it is. Like, if you're feeling overwhelmed or whatever, just like leave me a voice message. Like, I'll get back to you. So there's there's um, there aren't that many people. Like I said, I'm I'm not sure, but there aren't that many people that I'm aware of who are um, black folks who have their own businesses here. But there are a handful of us, and there will be more. So I just want everybody to know that if it's something that you're thinking about. There are resources here. I want to be a resource for you. And, you know, whatever I can do to make the path a little bit easier because there was nobody <laughs> blazing the trail for me, you know? So I did it for myself and I just want to make it easier for the next folks that come along. And so I've, I've been, you know, like I said, making a lot of friends and learning a lot of different things and um, whatever I can do to help encourage the next person and make it easier for them. I'm, I'm here for that. But I do want to point out, did y'all hear how she was like, but I'm not going to do it all. Because as Black women, we yeah. are conditioned, the expectation is we're, we're going to try and do it all and do it all for everybody. And y'all know on this channel, uh, we are about ease and doing things because they bring us joy, not because of somebody's expectations or what have you. So I'm glad that you you said that. I want you all to take note that she said that. Um, and well, it is about okay. joy. I mean, this is something that definitely like, I'm excited about it. And like I said, if it were something that I felt, I thought like this was like 10 years in the making because I could have done a food business like somewhere else. Like I said, I dabbled in a few things but I was really just like, mm, I want to be really protective of this thing that I love because I don't want to make it something that I then hate because, you know, I tried to make money off of it. But this, I will say, again, entrepreneurship in general is not for the faint of heart. And then when you're doing entrepreneurship in a foreign country, in a language is not your first, that just creates a whole nother level of challenges. Um and it's just one of those things where, like I said, you just have to, you just got to be mentally prepared for that. Um, but it's not impossible. It's doable. And I feel that even outside of like the community that I mentioned, there are a lot of folks who have restaurants here who I, I frequented their restaurants. Like before I even really like thought about doing this and I reached out to them or they 
found out that I was doing this and they were like, hey, whatever you need, let me know. And so I've been connected with like food vendors and, um, you know, contractors who helped me do the floor and people who did the painting and like fumigation and like all these things like and learning about, you know, like how you need to know where your water is coming from or where are you on the electric grid? Like all of these things that I probably wouldn't think to to ask because one, I've never I've never owned a food business before. I've never really owned any business that wasn't like a virtual one where I could do it online. So there's like a lot of stuff that I just wouldn't think to ask. And also a lot of things that maybe I took for granted because in the US, like that's just kind of, it's already taken care of. Like that's not a thing that you have to worry about. But here there's the official way of doing things, the unofficial way of doing things. And that's something that has to be learned as well. So I would say that it's not, it's not, it's not hard, but it is hard. I don't know. How I was going to say, I think, yeah. it's, I think it's kind of hard. Is Well, you just have to be determined and you can't be somebody that gets deterred easily. And, you know, if it's a no from somebody, there's always somebody else who's going to say yes. So you just got to find that person. And like I said, just have the, the persistence to keep going. Um, I have interviewed at least one, but possibly... No, I think two women who have had businesses here, but neither of them had sort of brick and mortar businesses. Mm -hmm. And so um, I want to talk about a little bit about like what that experience has been like as, as much as you are comfortable with, um, as, you know, because we did have a question about like, were there any requirements from the city? i.e. the state uh, for opening a food business, that sort of thing. Um, yes. Um, so there, I mean, a lot of the um, licenses and things you need can vary from delegation to delegation. So depending on where you are in the city and then where you are in the country of Mexico, what works or what I need for me might be different for you if you're, you know, two miles up the road or if you're, you know, two hours away by plane. So I just want to say like, it's, it's different. And so you have to investigate um, where you live. And ideally, you know, you can talk to other people, foreigners who own businesses there and find out from them, like what they needed. Um, especially for example, when it comes to alcohol, um, there are different rules around who can serve alcohol, where it can be served, what times it can be served, and what um, quant like what if you have beer and wine, that's like sort of like a lower level thing versus if you're selling mezcal and tequila and bourbon and like you know the more the stronger spirits. Um, and so there are definitely like per permisos or what they call like you know licenses that you need to be able to sell alcohol. And in the case, in my case, I'm only doing beer and wine, which for me is because I think hard alcohol invites problems that I don't want to have. And there's plenty of other places where people can go and get mezcal or whatever they need. So I don't feel like I need to compete in that way. Um, but in my case, I do have to serve food with the alcohol in order to be able to serve it. And I'm not really you're not going to see me like out here advertising the beer and wine and bottomless mimosas like super hard. Like it will be mentioned, but that's not the primary purpose of my business. So I'm not going to like put that out there because again, inviting problems that I don't want to have. So it's kind of a, a convoluted thing. And there's a lot of stuff that I don't even understand when it comes to it, but I have a really excellent lawyer who okay. understands what I need. And so when you have that kind of, uh, you know, resource, then it makes it a lot easier to be able to get what you need when you need it in order to open. But um, yeah, I started out doing private events in the physical space because it was taking a lot longer than I thought to get some of these permissions. But also there were some that I, that I believed that I had based on what my landlord told me and then come to find out I didn't actually have them. And so, so that's, again, another one of those things where 
you know, and some of this stuff in retrospect, it's like, you know, trust, but verify. Like, I know that mm -hmm. I know, but when you're in the middle of doing 20 million things, trying to get this thing built up, sometimes the most obvious questions that you should ask or things you should watch out for, you just kind of miss them because you're doing so much at one time. So now I'm, I have pretty much everything I need. There's like one other permit that I need to be able to um, sell alcohol like later into the evenings, which is why my hours are pretty short right now. I had initially envisioned having the restaurant open from 4 p.m. until about midnight. And right now the hours are from 1.30 to 9 p.m., Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So I will be changing the hours. I will be adding more days um, as we move things along. But I also feel like some of this stuff was a blessing in disguise because it made me, I had to pause and take this time to get these permissions and in the process of doing that, it kind of reminded me, okay, you got to walk before you run. So while you're waiting for this thing to come through, what can you be doing to refine processes, to define your operations plan and like getting your team together? So that way, when the permission does come, you're ready to be able to offer whatever it is that that permission is there for. So some of this stuff, like I said, it's, it's frustrating to um you know have a plan and then you can't execute the plan because there's something you didn't know but on the other hand sometimes those things need to happen for you to like recognize what the priorities are and, and you know and make a plan for for execution later on i have shared on this channel uh many a time how there is a a uniquely mexican way of doing things which might exist this way today, but mm -hmm. next week it's a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like the only thing certain is uncertainty and all of that. Um, having been here for nearly two years before you like took on this brick and mortar venture, I would assume that that was to your advantage because you had a chance to kind of acclimate to the culture and get a sense of how things are done? Is that the case? Yeah, I mean, so I did, um, I mentioned I lived in Morocco for two years. I was there because I did the Peace Corps there. And one of the things that I was very grateful that I learned before I went to Morocco, I had this assignment when I was in school to like interview um, Peace Corps volunteers who were alumni from the University of Maryland, which is uh, my alma mater. And when I talked to them, a lot of them told me, you're going to have this idea that when you go into your service in Morocco, that you're going to do these huge, amazing things. Like you're going to be building schools and like digging wells and like, you know, whatever, doing all these amazing things. But the fact of the matter is, is that only a very small percentage of volunteers actually do that. Most of what volunteers do is sitting and having tea and talking to people. And yes, there's some work that you will do, but it'll be like, you know, maybe you taught a few people the difference between the three theirs in English. And like, that was like the biggest impact, you know, that you had. So just recognize that when you go in, it's, it's gonna, the culture shock and everything that you experience is going to be a lot emotionally and on your mental health. But the most important thing is that you know that you're there to get to know the community and to be a part of the community and that you're a 20 something from the US and you don't know anything about them and what their needs are. So what the best thing you can do is just to hush and listen and learn and act accordingly. And I feel like that lesson is exactly how I entered into Mexico. I have ideas about Mexico based on the media, things that I've seen you know, in, in Hollywood and on Netflix, like all that kind of stuff. But at least I know that like, there's that side and then there's what it actually is. And so I'm going to go with an open mind. I'm going to make friends. I'm going to do my best to speak the language, even though if I don't get it right, I want people to at least see that I'm trying and making an effort. And so I feel like going into it with that same mindset is how I went into Morocco. It helped tremendously because it just made me more observant it made me more engaged with the culture versus, um, you know, just staying, I'm not going to say that I don't, like I hang out probably way more than I should with other Americans, which is why like my Spanish is good. It could be better if I wasn't speaking English all the time, 
But that being said, I still feel like a part of the community that I live in in my neighborhood. And I have Mexican friends and I have a Mexican boyfriend now and I practice my Spanish all the time. And so I do feel like I had the vast majority of those two years just like, like I said, just preparing for this endeavor. And I didn't realize it at the time, but when I made a decision to start the restaurant, all of that, you know, year and a half, almost two years experience was on my side and helped me get the start that I needed. And I didn't even mention this, but I almost set this thing up in Oaxaca because I went down there on vacation um, in July of last year and loved it. And I thought like, oh, this is like such a foodie place. Like, would it be a great place to have a soul food restaurant? I had put a deposit down on a place inside of this food hall and everything. And then I kind of realized like, but if you move to Oaxaca, you're gonna have to start completely over. You don't really know anybody there. You have all of these resources and people that you've met and like all your, your tribe is here. So, you know, I moved too fast. I made a rash decision. That money is probably never coming back to me. <laughs> um, but lesson learned. Uh, and so I just think that, again, you have to, it's kind of, yeah, it's just the idea of like, if you're going to put down roots somewhere, don't go and try to change them and go somewhere else. Like use what you have where you are. And if you're comfortable in the place where you are, then build on that until you're ready to like make your move. But keeping an eye out for a really good accountant, keeping an eye out for like somebody who's a really good lawyer, whether it's a labor lawyer or, you know, small business lawyer, things like that. Um, you know, being nice to the people who collect your trash every day because they need to collect trash from your restaurant too. Like, so all of these little things, they, they add up. And I really, Oaxaca would have been cool, but I knew in my heart of hearts that I was supposed to be here in Mexico City and I'm glad that I stayed. So thousand dollar mistake, but <laughs> it is what it is now. <laughs> um, would you have been able to do this without the Spanish that you've gained? Um, yes, but it would be much harder. It would be much harder. Um, I would say that I have, there's been, so for example, I have, uh, one, two, three, four, five, I have like five people on my team who are helping me at the restaurant and only two, two and a half of the five speak English. Um, so even like in the behind the scenes, like in the kitchen and stuff, I'm speaking Spanish to the people who are on my team and, they, I wish, I wish they were here to. T I would love to know what their thoughts are about it. Because sometimes, like when I'm stressed out, like my Spanish, I'm just like, Ugh, you know, like I can't even get the words out, you know. So somehow they manage to understand me, or they just do what I do and not what I say, and it just works out that way. Um, but I do think that for certain jobs, like for the instance, um, the waiters, uh, for instance, the tax person that I'm looking to hire, stuff like that. I just, I know that I need to have English speakers because I need to be able to communicate with them. And there's, especially when it comes to like taxes and business stuff, I don't want there to be any issue there, you know? So there's things like that where you can find the people, but it's a little bit harder because obviously like that's not the, the predominant language here. Um, but I do think having some basic understanding of Spanish or at least having, if you have like a business partner that you super trust to work with you, who can be that person who has the language and who can explain things, then, you know, that works too. Um, but I just think that it would be a lot hard. It is hard already and my Spanish is pretty good. So if I didn't have it at all, it would be really difficult, I think. I, I would just imagine that if you spoke no Spanish, because I see it's not mostly women who do this, but I do see these people who post and it's like, yeah, like I want to move there and I want to start a business. Yeah. And you ask, well, like, how's your Spanish? And it's, I don't speak Spanish. And I would just imagine that like with all the things that go into opening a, a business and you're going to do it in another country and you don't speak the language of that country, like 
I, not only just would that make it difficult to communicate, but I would I would think that there would be this extra layer of barrier there because if I'm a vendor, if I'm somebody who provides services and you don't even speak the language of my country, yeah, I might feel some kind of way about that. Well, I think that it makes it, I think it was two things. Like if you don't speak the language and you're not even trying, because like there's people who show up in the restaurant who won't even say hola to the waiter. I'm like, that's like literally the least thing that you can do is just say hola and then just do that kind of dumb smile. We're like, I don't really know what you're saying. And like, we get it, we get it. But at least like, just say hola. But there's some people who won't even do that. And that's the kind of thing where I think that people won't want to work with you or they'll work with you just to take advantage of you because they know you're not going to understand. So um, I think that, you know, if you go into it with like a little bit of humility, then at least you're not offending people, but also you're still going to have that problem of like the gringo tax, as they say, or whatever, or it'll be really easy for somebody to get over on you because they know that they can because you don't understand. So, yeah. And like I said, again, my Spanish is pretty good. But even I still have issues sometimes and and make mistakes. And, um, you know, for the most part, my experiences with the vendors I work with has been very positive, with the exception of one. Um, and in that case, you know, people, there's no matter what culture you're in, sometimes there's just like bad actors. And unfortunately, every now and then you're going to find one of those. I found one of those when it came to getting the chairs made for my business. And now I'm having to go and pay extra money to get these chairs fixed because this person did a terrible shoddy job and then wasn't even, you know, a pleasure to work with on top of that. So, you know, you can't win them all. But again, it helps to have a little bit of Spanish <laughs> for these moments. Okay. So we had another question. Um, can you open a brick and mortar business with out being a Mexican citizen? I think the answer to that yes. is yes. Yes. Do you have to have residency to open a business? Yes. I'm going to say yes. I don't know that for sure, but I can't imagine that they would let somebody on a tourist visa open a, a business. So I think you, and I have temporary residency. I do not have permanent residency. So, um, and I think there's some, I've talked to a couple of different lawyers I own my business 100%. I was told by some other people that you need to have a Mexican citizen in order to be able to open the business. Um, in my case, I had somebody ready to go who would have helped me, and that would have been a good um, partnership there. But it was important to me. I think, again, just it's like for cultural reasons, Black women reasons, like I just wanted to own my thing 100% if I could. And so I had, a, again, an ace lawyer who helped me and I just got my business incorporated. I have a tax ID number now and I'll be you know, able to open a bank account for my business here really soon too. So it is possible. Um, like I said, it just matters to have the right, um, the right team in place to help you execute and, and get that done. But you can do it as a temporary residence, resident okay. or resident, yeah. Okay. Um, how difficult would you say it has been to open your business? Hmm. For in terms of like a food business, um, like would it would if you were not opening a brick and mortar restaurant, mm -hmm. if you were doing something else, would that have been easier? Yeah. So like I have a friend who has like a secret supper club that's also here in the same neighborhood in Narvarte. Um, and he is, and I can think of like one other really popular restaurant that operated, I mean, there's no other way to say it, like that operated illegally <laughs> for like the first, you know, like year and a half that it was open. And at least in their case, they were able to get away with it and kind of fly under the radar because they were up on a rooftop. And so it was a little bit more private. And so in my case, that would be difficult for me because I'm on the ground floor right next to a public park, um, you know. And so in that case, um, it was 
it, it was important to me to get things as right as possible and to get as legal as possible. Like, things can still happen, you know, even if you have all your papers in order, because if somebody wants to mess with you, they're going to mess with you. Um, so, you know, there's things like that that just can't be avoided. So far, I've been okay, and hopefully things will continue that way. Um, but if you want to start a food business, um, I think there's a lot of people here who start food businesses and they don't, and they are citizens and they don't have all the paperwork they need because it's expensive to get all that stuff. And so they kind of just start how they start and maybe they get away with it or they have to pay somebody off. Like there's, you know, different realities for, um, different businesses, but so far, um, I have been able to get all the paperwork that I've needed to at least get started at the capacity that I am now. And like I said, there's more paperwork coming to be able to operate in the way that I initially envisioned. Okay. Um, I had a question and it just left. So we'll see if it comes back. Um, do you know if like if opening a business could help somebody change their residency status? Um, my lawyer said like, you're not going to jump the line and be able to go from temporary resident to permanent resident in less than four years. So it's not going to help you in that way. But when you make your case for permanent residency and you're showing that you have invested in the economy, there's nothing about that that's going to hurt your chances for, you know, getting permanent residency. Um, what has the hiring process been like? Did you get a lot of applications? Um, initially, I so I was working with a, a restaurant consultant who's from the U.S., but he's lived in Mexico for seven years. And so he really helped me um, because I was like wheel spinning with all the different things that had to be done. And so he took some stuff off my plate. And one thing was putting applications out. Um, we started mostly with like culinary schools like looking for students um, because they have typically like more flexible schedules. They're interested in um, learning cuisines that are different from what they would be learning in school. Um, and so we found a lot of people through that. And I did those, he did a preliminary interview and then I did secondary interviews and then we went from there. And then since I added the Google business profile, um, and a goo in a um, WhatsApp business profile, people have. I've been getting more like random messages from people asking if I'm hiring or not, and I don't tend to respond to those messages. I'm definitely one of those people who I want a recommendation from somebody, or I want them to have found out about me through, you know, like like I said, like uh, a channel where they saw the job description that I put up versus just cold sending me a message and asking me if I'm gonna hire. Um, I've had, when I first started and I've been open, this was last weekend was the fourth weekend that I was really like open besides like the Super Bowl thing that you came to and one other thing that I did before. But when I first got started, I had three employees who were like kitchen staff. Two of them are not with me anymore. Um, and they have since been replaced, but one of them was a friend who was looking for a part-time job even though she had her own business going on and you know another cautionary tale sometimes it's not always a good idea to work with your friends Whoa. like you really have to you know and so like we're it's cool we're on good terms but it just was very clear that her passion was her business and that was what came first and i'm like i hear you i get that but i'm also starting and this is my passion and if you're going to work for me, then I need you to be like all in. And if you can't be all in, then, you know, we just got to call it what it is and go our separate ways. So that's what happened there. And then the second person, um, she, it was a shame because I really liked her. She was like a super like good leader in the kitchen and, you know, just our, we had, everybody had good chemistry, but she even though the pay was listed in the job description as well as discussed in both interviews, she worked for me for about a month, a little bit less than a month, and then decided that she wanted double um, what I was offering for the same work. And she threatened like legal action if I wouldn't give her that. 
she had no legal grounds to do that. Again, another ace lawyer thing. And so it was just like, all right, well, thank you so much. Bye. You know, like if you, you could just come and have a conversation with me versus taking things like to the next level like that. So cooking um, staff and hiring has definitely been, the people is the hardest part. That's like the hardest part of like any job. I feel like it's the people, you know, like you can deal with the ups and downs of the work, but the people challenges are the ones that are unpredictable. And so um, I, I don't know, prayed on it and just was like, universe, just send me some good people. And so far, knock on wood, it seems like it has been. But that's also the nature of the restaurant business too. Like there's a lot of turnover. People leave for different reasons. Um, and that just kind of is how it is. But, you know, working through those growing pains. Um, we have another question about taxes. Mm -hmm. Do you pay taxes in Mexico for your business? I just got started. So I will be paying taxes for my business in Mexico. And uh, yeah, that is nothing to play with. So uh, I have, um, like I said, I've been keeping track of like my receipts and expenses and things. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I could have gotten written off if I had had the business incorporated in the tax ID sooner. But again, there's sometimes there's just things happen the way they happen. And so I won't be getting write-offs for a lot of this stuff. And it just kind of is what it is. But I am working to find like a tax person that I trust who can help me navigate the tax system here because it's just different than in the US and it's foreign to me. So I need that that guidance. Yeah. But yes, Mexico, I will be paying my taxes. Don't come for me. Yeah. Um, Y'all, if anybody is doing any kind of work in Mexico with Mexican sourced income, whether they're running somebody's Airbnb, they've got a popsicle stand, whatever, they are supposed to be paying taxes. And as a foreigner, uh, you need to make sure you pay your taxes. And talking about the support, I didn't know if you saw this. So far, glad to support strong. I love you, Mexico, so close to the soul food culture. Thanks for showing us. Really <laughs> Gracias. Mucho amor. That's our boyfriend. Well, I, I, know. Don't know. <laughs> well, I don't know what his title is, but that's my man in the comments supporting his woman. See? Support, support in all his forms. <laughs> okay. All right. So if somebody is watching this and they think they might be in Mexico City in the next few weeks, what can they expect on to see on the menu? On the menu next few weeks. Um I so right now. Uh, if you're familiar with like the meat plus three concept, I'm kind of doing something like that, except for it's meat plus two. So you get like a protein um, or in the case of the uh, vegetarians, like I said, the mushroom etouffee. Um, are mushrooms a protein? I don't know. Yeah, Maybe. I, are they? Well, I know. I'm asking the wrong I'm not person. Allowed to, <laughs> I'm not allowed to answer those kind of questions. <laughs> well, you get some sustenance uh, in the main in form of like a main plate. And then um, you get two sides that come with it that's included in the price. And then we'll be having like some um, some add-ons. Like, uh, for example, one thing, I can't take them off the menu because they're too popular, but I don't want to make them like a main plate. Um, but uh, again, kind of like a soul food Mexican fusion thing. The Buffalo Al Pastor hot wings have been like super popular. So this is, you know, like buffalo wings like we're used to, but then with the uh, Al Pastor marinade that goes on Al Pastor tacos. So it's like a combination of those two. So that will stay um, a runaway hit. I almost didn't even put it on the menu, but it's here to stay. The avocado and mango salad with like pickled carrots. Like, again, I know you're not a vegetable person, but for everybody else who's eating um, vegetables, like that salad is so popular. We run out almost every weekend collard greens will definitely stay. Um, and I'm working, like I said, on a stuffed collard green recipe. And the things that are missing right now that I feel like I'm getting clowned on in these streets about cornbread, biscuits, and um, sweet. you know the rolls and all that stuff. Look, I brought a brand new oven and the oven had issues, or a brand new stove, and the stove part is working, but the oven had issues. And so that's why there hasn't been any like 
baked things like cornbread and all that kind of stuff on there. So it's coming. Um, you know, if you want to, you want to donate to me directly, you could do that. I'm happy to share like my, you know, cash app, PayPal, all that kind of stuff. But also the easiest way that you can support me right now is just to come to the restaurant and eat and bring your friends because, you know, we're only open three days right now. I, like I said, I want to be open more days, but we're just trying to get things right um, initially with these three days and with the menu that we have. So, you know, the more people come in, the more money I have to pay my staff and to be able to invest back in the business. So that's the most direct way right now that you can support is just by coming through, eating, and then telling people about the place. Um, and like I said, the menu, I have some more things planned. It's coming along. Um, Pop-ups are not completely out of the question in other places. So I will be still doing some stuff um, outside of the restaurant. And I am, I'll just put this out there for anybody who might be interested. I am excited and happy to host pop-ups by anyone who wants to come and try a concept um, during the days when I don't have service. So that would be like Monday through Thursday at this point. Um, I know one of the hardest things for me when I was starting out and doing the pop-ups is once we outgrew my apartment, which was, like I said, from the very first, <laughs> the very first event, it became very difficult to find places to do pop-ups where they wouldn't charge you so much money for the rent that you would have to up the price of your tickets to cover the cost of the rent plus food costs, and then hopefully be able to make a little bit extra. So it was really hard to, um, to find those spaces. And that was another reason why I wanted to do the brick and mortar because I just wanted to have like a space of my own. But if I can be a resource for somebody who's thinking about opening their food business or just wants to try something, the space is here. I want to welcome you, whatever I can do to support, um, you know, I'm here. Just let me know. Okay. And so Natasha is co-signing on the salad, glass <laughs> half full, saw pictures of the salad. OMG. So there you go. There you go. Right now, currently, the restaurant is open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Yes, right? Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 1.30 p.m. until 9 p.m. And I would say if you are able to, if you're on Instagram, follow, and you'll, I'll be updating there for sure. And same thing on the Facebook page. Like I said, the Facebook page is really light right now because it's very new. Like it's only like a week and a half old. So I need to add more stuff on there. But I'll be updating on those platforms. And then, of course, the Google profile also has the hours and days that were open on there as well. So any changes will be announced and they will be made on all of those platforms. But for now, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 1.30 to 9 p.m. And when you say Google profile, you mean like if on I'm Google in Mexico Maps. City, I go to Google Maps mm -hmm. and I could search Black Soul Cina. Food? or Black Sea Cocina and it'll pop up, show me where y'all are, show me your hours. All that good stuff. Yeah, I haven't tried to search soul food on there, so I don't know if it would come up or not. And I can't think of like when the Google profile was made anywhere where it allowed me to put that particular term in there. The okay. categories that they have are super narrow, so it just says like American restaurant right now. Um, but hopefully, as people start finding out more about it, then the algorithm will help. I don't know, <laughs> make it come up um, when people Google it outside of Google Maps. Uh-oh, I don't know if people can still hear me if we're live, what happened? But yeah, so like I said, come through. Um, I, I'm trying to think of other things I can tell you guys about it while maybe the, the video unfreezes. Um, I don't have any plans for cooking classes, but I'm open to that if people want to do it. Um, what else? Uh, oh, oh no, she's gone, but I'm still here. Um, I'm trying to look at like some of the other comments and stuff. Um, I don't know what else I can, <laughs> what else I can tell you guys. Um, if you have any questions, write them because I don't know what else to say. Um, yes, please post re reviews on Google. They help people find it, um, pictures and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm trying to think of, uh, you know, other things that I, 
that I need, but I don't know. I think the Google sharing on Google, sharing with your friends, like all that stuff is really, really great. And um, obviously any, if anybody out there is connected with folks in the press, like Travel Noir, um, I don't know, New York Times, Travel, Fugly, any anywhere, like if I can get my name out there um, and get more publicity for the restaurant, that would be huge, especially as we're just starting out. Um, I am looking for, um, yeah, other opportunities to learn and hone my own cooking skills. So for example, um, and actually I would say this too, if there's anybody out there, the things that are missing in Mexico city right now, Ethiopian food, uh, Caribbean food of any kind. Um, if you have, more, more black barbers who know how to cut black hair. Um, I think there's a lot of braiders here. I don't know if there's like, there's only one like bona fide brick and mortar that I know of um, where people can get like braids done or like their locks adjusted. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity for those types of, um, of foods out here. And so if anybody wants to do like pop-ups in my space, or if you're thinking about opening, you know, like, a, like I said, any kind of, um, any kind of, black food, um, you will be welcome here because there's not just, it's not just about like the black Americans and folks that are here who want to support those kind of businesses. But I think a lot of, um, the opportunity comes from the fact that there's just like a lot of people, locals, nationals, Mexican nationals who don't, they don't even know what they're missing because they haven't had it before. But a lot of the ingredients and like the flavors that we share, and all of that stuff is, there's a lot of similarity there and there's a lot that you can do with the ingredients that are here. And if you can't find something you're looking for, there are ways to, you know, get it imported. There are ways to, like in the case of me with the collard greens, um, working with a farmer to grow what is missing. Um, and in this case, this particular farmer, I found him because somebody had told me that he was growing collard greens because he bought kale seeds or he thought he bought kale seeds and he accidentally bought collard greens. And the only reason that he has the collards is because it was, you know, an accidental purchase and he just grew them, but he was having a hard time um, selling them because people didn't know what they were. Um, and that is how I found him. And so every other week, um, like I said, I have the monopoly on the green, so I'm getting the greens from him and I'm going to be, you know, growing some more. Um, the, somebody asked about the fusion. Um, I'm going to be, honestly, I'm just inspired by the things that I eat here, you know, in the street. I'm a really adventurous, adventurous. I have my boundaries, like when it comes to like, you know, brains and eyes and things like that, but I'm a really adventurous eater. And I just feel inspired by all the places that I've traveled and lived. And I'm always like, thinking about how I can recreate something or if something reminds me of another thing, how I can like incorporate that flavor into the other. So I think that's just a creative outlet for me is just, um, you know, thinking about food and, and different ways that I can, can um, play with it and just be creative in my kitchen. I feel like the kitchen is the canvas for me and everything that comes from there is just, like I said, like a creative outlet. Um, how did I meet my boyfriend? I met him on Tinder. <laughs> so that was uh, something that I joined when I first got here, not just for dating, but just to make friends. And it was a really great um, resource for a while until I got tired of it. But it was a great resource to get to know the city through people who had been here or who lived here. Um, and so there are things that I got to do and experiences that I otherwise I might have had them, but I wouldn't have had them until way later on in my in my time here. Um, if I hadn't have, you know, gone out and, and tried some things with some folks who are, who are from here. Um, how do I source local ingredients? Um, well, there's a play, there's so many different markets here, first of all, um, and bigger ones, but like one of the big, big ones is called Central de Abastos. All the food that comes through the other markets in Mexico City, it has to move through that place first, because that's kind of like the hub of all of the the ingredients, like fresh food and dry food. And um, they have everything there. They have, uh, you know, um, plates and Tupperware and takeout, kind of thing. like everything. If you can't find it in Abastos, um, 
it may not exist here in Mexico. But so I've been there once um, with a friend. It is so overwhelming. It's so big. Um, it's really cool to go. I recommend, you know, spending some time there, um, going with like a friend. Cause like, again, I said, it is very overwhelming. Um, but also they have just like the same way some people have personal shoppers for clothes. There are shoppers who will go and they will, um, do the shopping for you. So I send a list to a guy that I have every single week. This is what I need. This is how much I need. Um, sometimes if there's something I'm not sure about, I'll send him a picture. Like I need this specific, I'm having, I've had such a hard time finding like macaroni noodles. And so sometimes I've had to find, or I've had to use other types of pasta, other shapes of pasta for the macaroni and cheese. And so I found the one that I wanted. I sent him a picture and I said, can you get this one? And he said, yes. And so he's been able to get that for me. Um, he's not good about everything. So like, for example, I've gotten some shrimp from him. I don't really like the quality of the shrimp, whoever he's getting it from. So I won't buy shrimp from him. I'll just go find somebody else who can provide that. Um, but you know, I think there's different people who do that kind of personal shopping for you. So there's different options if you, um, you know, can't get a, an ingredient from a certain person and especially as a small business and I don't have a car. So like when I have, I do like today I went to Costco, but I have a driver who will meet me at Costco. He helps me load all my stuff and I can pay him to take me. One time we went to like seven different places in a day and I just paid him to drive me around and he just waits for me and he helps me unload my stuff and then we go to the next place. And and so there's a way if you you know spend the money to pay to get those things that um, you need, especially as a small business getting started up. So the personal shopper who brings things to me that helps me save on time and I'm not running around to different places trying to source different ingredients. And then the driver um, who can just take me wherever it is I need to go, that's another great resource that I have as well. And then, um, you know, besides that, my, my boyfriend also works with me in the business and he's been a super big help. Just like when there's times where I can't say what I wanna say in Spanish, um, he'll step in and, and do that for me. Um, he'll help me fix something or figure out who can fix something. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, we, I got lucky in that way that he was there and this is something that excites him too. Um, but it's definitely one of those things where, um, you know, if I didn't have him, I would have to probably like hire an assistant, you know, to, to help me get through some of the stuff. So that has definitely helped as well. Um, what else can I say? How did I learn to speak Spanish? Well, um, you know, I started learning Spanish for the first time when I was 13. Um, but I didn't really take it seriously until I was in high school and I took Spanish classes, um, from, yeah, like from the age of 13 to like eighth grade all the way through college. And then when I was in college, I did a semester abroad in Costa Rica and my Spanish got really, really good there. Um, definitely, I had, before this boyfriend I have here, I had one um, in uh, Costa Rica. And so he definitely helped me um, practice my Spanish and learn Spanish. So when you're around the language, you have to actually spend time with people who speak it and speak it with them in order to get good at it. So there's only so much that you can learn um, from the textbook, but then there's the, the textbook way of speaking and the colloquial way of speaking, and that's different from for from every country and definitely here in Mexico City the the colloquial Spanish is very very unique um something I haven't quite mastered yet either but um yeah so I've been speaking Spanish and practicing and um definitely I need to continue to practice like I can feel the limits of my Spanish um especially when I'm in the kitchen um because there's things that I I can have I have good conversational like basic conversational Spanish, but I don't have legal Spanish. I don't have business Spanish. Um, I know the word for boil. I'm not quite sure how to conjugate it in all the different ways yet. So there's like things like that. Um, what is the word for overcooked in Spanish? Like there's stuff like that where I'll be in the moment and I'm like, dang, I don't know how to say that. So I really need to spend more time like learning the vocabulary just for the kitchen. But I'll be honest with you, I haven't had a lot of time to do it because I've just been so busy 
um, dealing with all the problems that come with having like a startup business. So every every day is like a new challenge and it makes it really difficult to, to focus on vocab. Yay, looks like maybe Adelia's back, maybe. Can't hear her. Um, Yeah, so anyway, so that's the things I'm working on because I just want to be, I want to be better for my staff. I have a really, really awesome team. Um, everybody is just really, really wonderful and we have great chemistry um, and I couldn't do what I'm doing without them. So yeah, definitely, definitely really grateful to my all Mexican staff. Like we're we're really doing it, so and it's been exciting to teach them um, the recipes and for them to learn about my culture and um, you know the the again the ways that we have similar or the same ingredients, but we just prepare them in different ways. So it's been really really fantastic to to have this experience and that that kind of stuff and like the food tastes good because it's prepared with love. And one of my, fa I always say this, like one of my favorite things about the kitchen right now is the laughter that comes out of it. Like we really enjoy each other. And even though we don't always like understand each other, like we, we still get each other, you know? So I'm really grateful that that spirit and, you know, like I said, the love and the, the, just like all the intention that goes into the food and the hands that prepare it. Um, that is what makes it so special. And that's why I'm excited to see this restaurant grow. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, the restaurant is on Instagram. The um, handle is at Black Sea Cocina. So it's B-L-A-X-I-C-O-C-I-N-A. Uh, and Black Sea Cocina came from a mashup of Black Mexican and then cocina, which means kitchen in Spanish. So that's how Black Sea Cocina came to be. Um, and I also call it BLX for short. So you'll see that sometimes. Um, and that's how I'm referring to the restaurant. But it's Black Sea Cocina and BLX is the nickname. And it's located in Narvarte, which is about 10, 15 minutes south of Roma and Condesa. Um, I think a lot of people wanted me to open up in those neighborhoods and I didn't want to because yes, they're so popular. There's a lot of foreigners there. There's a lot of opportunity, but they have so much competition. Um, and I think I have a bigger impact in the neighborhood that I'm in. Plus also I live three minutes walking from the restaurant. So that makes it easy for me again, as somebody who doesn't have a car, I'm not paying, um, you know, uh, Uber or like having to get on the bus and take the metro and bring ingredients from my house to the restaurant that way. So um, Narvarte is really special, um, and this particular corner of it has a very like eclectic, eclectic um, kind of hipster vibe to it. I would say, which probably is why I think after living in Portland for eight years, um, there there's something I didn't even realize it until somebody said it the other day. But that's probably a little bit of you know what has to do with why I like it here so much. But it's it's really calm. I love the palm trees. It's very young. I think the average age in this neighborhood is like 35 um, years old. Um, that's what I found in the market research that I was doing. And also Cinnabon opened up here recently, which uh, if we were gonna have like something from the US, like I wish it wasn't a Cinnabon. Uh, I think they're so gross. But a Cinnabon opened up here, and there's another um, restaurant called Peltre, which has about like 20 other locations around the city. So I don't have a team of market research people to look into the different areas um, that I'm in and tell me like, oh, you have the most chance of success in this area. The fact that there's a Cinnabon here and that this place, Peltre, that has 20 other locations open up a spot here they have teams that do market research. And so that's kind of how I knew that this was going to be, you know, an up and I could see it for myself because I lived in this neighborhood for a year prior to opening the business. But I could see from what I was seeing with my own eyes and the people and like more English being spoken versus when I first got here, it definitely seemed like it was way more, you know, barrio, way more Mexican. Um, but you can see how the prices from Roma and Condesa are 
pushing people further this way and then even beyond Narvarte into places like uh, Portales, which is just south of here. So there's just a lot of, um, you know, um, a lot of gentrification that was already happening, but that is happening now um, because of the influx of, of foreigners here. So um, that's something that we didn't talk about. That's something that I grapple with all the time, like my role in in gentrification in Mexico City, because obviously I'm bringing people to this neighborhood that maybe otherwise wouldn't have been here if it wasn't for my restaurant. And I think that unfortunately, wherever we are, gentrification is a thing that's going to happen. But in my case, I'm trying to be as respectful of the culture as possible. I'm trying to educate people. I'm making fusion food and showing them that I care about their food and showing how it can have a connection to my food. And so I'm trying to just be as respectful as possible. I'm speaking the language. I'm continuing to learn the language. My staff is 100% Mexican. I'm pretty sure every single vendor that I buy from is Mexican. So I'm doing what I can to support the community that's around me and the community that has welcomed me with open arms. And I know that that is maybe not enough for everybody, but you can't please everybody. But I'm doing what I can to just show that I'm trying to be the most respectful gringa I can be. Welcome back. <laughs> I've been keeping them entertained. <laughs> I've been holding it down. Yeah. I appreciate you because I tried uh -huh. every kind of way to get on my phone and it was the internet. Everything was like, no, girl, we, we're not doing Wi-Fi. We're not doing mobile, nothing. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's from the, the audio producer of me. I'm like, all right, we got to keep this thing going. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we were before my electricity disappeared. We were getting ready to wrap this up. I'm absolutely positive that Tiara has answered all of your questions. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Thanks for having me. And like I said, y'all come through support. And if anybody is thinking of opening something, trying something, please know that I'm a resource and I'm here for you. And just send me a DM. Um, through the Black Seagull Cena Instagram page or however you can find me and let's sit down and have a conversation hopefully over some, hopefully over some peach cobbler. Peach cobbler. <laughs> All right. So one more time in case you don't have the IG for Black Seagull Cena, there it is on your screen. It is also linked below in the description. Um, so yeah, you're in Mexico City. Go check out the restaurant, support uh, Black women. That's what we do here. Thank you so much uh, for being a gracious guest and a host. Uh, <laughs> for sure. Thank right. you for inviting me. No problem. Thank y'all for hanging out through the, the technical glitches and all um and uh who knows i might go live tomorrow the retreat starts on wednesday so i will not be live this wednesday that's i'm gonna be busy uh but who knows maybe i can figure out something tomorrow so thank you all for coming through and being such a great audience and please go check out uh tiara's restaurant